Everybody. Well, uh, we'll get started. Uh, this is the second session of the morning, uh, and we have a three for one deal. Our original advertising was that uh, Paris would be speaking. Uh, it is now Paris and Tim and John all presenting. Uh, uh, they talk about engaging with open data through video games, and I invite you to welcome them all to the stage. Hi everyone, can everyone hear me? Good, that's working. Okay, There's, there are three of us here, so I'm sorry if that confuses you. We'll try and be less confusing than we normally are. Uh, I'm Paris, this is Tim, this is John. You can find us on Twitter and tweet us during the presentation. Because there's three of us, we can reply, which is why we do this. Uh, we like getting tweets during the presentation. We're very, very used to uh, speaking overseas, so we have a slide in here that explains where we're from. Uh, this is Tasmania. <laughs> That's where Tasmania is. We're subject of Her Majesty, but you don't care about that. So we're going to move on, but just in case you are confused as to where you are, this is a little update for you. So we make games. We're primarily game developers. Uh, we also write books. We've built a lot of games. We spend most of our professional life building games, uh, primarily for children, but we build all sorts of games. We also write a lot of books, uh, often about games, like the Kerbal Player's Guide, which we released about a month ago. You should buy it. Uh, this talk is about how open data and video games is an excellent combination. Uh, really, what this talk is actually about is it's about hackathons. Uh, hackathons are where you get together, uh, cover yourself in Doritos, drink Mountain Dew, and build something. Uh, and we would like to tell you a little bit about what we think you can do at hackathons when it comes to video games and open data, because we think it's a really underappreciated area. There's lots of game jams, but those are very specific to the game community. And there's lots of hackathons which are not, and we think they should be combined a bit more often. So the situation, uh, as we see it, is there's a lot of uh, passion about open data. Uh, governments like the idea of open data. Corporations like the idea of open data. Open data is very fashionable at the moment. It's a really great time to be interested in playing with open data. And governments like to use the word innovation a lot. And they've heard that making data available is a great way to get that sweet, sweet innovation and make people think they're very cool and passionate. Uh, so there's a lot of cool stuff out there to play with that wasn't previously available. Uh, Hackathons are also very fashionable at the moment and have been for the last few years. Uh, they're getting increasingly popular in the private sector as well. So even things that aren't governments are running hackathons where they're releasing uh, their data openly uh, because it's kind of seen as an inexpensive R&D concepting exercise. So companies like Qantas and so on are running hackathons, which are really cool. Uh, so the basic recipe for a hackathon is you put a bunch of nerds in a room, you let them stew for several days and you extract all the innovation out of them afterwards. Uh, this is at least from the perspective of the people who run them, as far as we can tell. Uh, GovHack is a good example of this, so, although perhaps for less cynical purposes. We love GovHack. Uh, it comes under the auspices of Linux Australia. It's an Australian New Zealand open data hackathon. It's really awesome. It's themed around using data sources from the Australian New Zealand governments, but it also encompasses lots of other data from local councils and small companies and things like that. Uh, it's, as far as we know, it might be the largest open government data hackathon in the world or something along those lines. Uh, we've done GovHack for many years. GovHack's really great. Great stuff gets made. Really cool uh, ideas appear. People do all sorts of really, really cool stuff with the data. Uh, but there's a problem. So this is GovHack in Tasmania from a few years ago. Uh, there's a problem. Uh, hackathons are fun. Uh, they reinforce a bit of a culture of work until you can't uh, and foster lots of unhealthy and weird working habits where people just stay up all night and then die. Uh, but that's not the main problem I want to talk about today. Just digressing a little bit because I have a problem with that myself. Uh, hackathons are often very oriented around making a product or something that's a bit startup-y or you know, a web app based type thing. Uh, they're oriented about making stuff. But these things are often never followed up on. So we get a whole lot of map box mashups, open street map mashups, things that people have fun with for a weekend and then put on some random AWS instance and then never touch again. So they just slowly die and never actually get used. Uh, people promise themselves that they'll finish them up, but they don't, no matter how wonderful they might be or how motivated they might be during the hackathon. They just go home and sleep and then forget about it and never touch it again. They might dump it on GitHub if you're lucky, but even then. Uh, game jams know this. So game jams are hackathons focused on making games. And game jams realize that you're unlikely to follow it up. Uh, game jams never aim to create a product-like thing as part of their outcome. They just want you to make something. So the 
uh, onus on you to follow through is not there, so you don't feel as bad when you don't. And the thing that you've made at a game jam is often more likely to be fun in its own right and playable uh, by itself and finished. They also aim to show something cool. Uh, game jams often geared around impressing people rather than uh, trying to make something you can productize or turn into a startup that you never actually will. So they're often a lot more social and less competitive than hackathons, which we like. Uh, prizes happen, but they're often an after afterthought at game jams, as opposed to many hackathons where prizes are the thing and people are competing. Uh, hackathons are a lot more explicitly competitive, in other words. Uh, game jam games are made quickly and then abandoned immediately, which is a really good thing. Uh, you still get people going, oh man, this is cool, I want to finish it, but games don't need to have users or customers or web hosting or some sort of AWS instance needs to stay up in order to be a viable thing most of the time, and uh, games can stay on their own. A, really phenomenally successful game that's come out of a game jam is Towerfall Ascension, which hopefully many of you have heard of. This was a game that arose from a game jam, which actually did get finished and turned into a product. Uh, products do come out of jams, but they're the exception and not the rule most of the time. Another one hopefully many of you have heard of is Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. That came out of a game jam. Uh, game jams are basically for practice and for honing your skills. So they're a really great time to hone your artistic, your development skills, your uh, team management skills and so on, and they're really not as competitive as hackathons. Um, so the real question is, why, why are we attempting to shoehorn a video game into GovHack, uh, which uh, has an otherwise quite serious context? Um, and that's because games do matter, even in really serious contexts, uh, even in the land of people who constantly wear suits with really impressive shoulders. Um, so you can still have games in there, and that's because games teach. You can learn things from games. Um, and games are engaging, or should be engaging, or else you've made a bad game. Um, so they can teach and you can engage. So it's a, realistically a good thing to fit in with these serious environments, because it introduces a little bit of fun and you learn from it. Uh, so what we did is we just smashed the two things together. Uh, so basically we took the concept uh, of GovHack and we used it as an excuse to have a game jam. Um, the really important thing there is without being jerks, you don't just show and be like, we're not going to do anything, we're just going to sit in here and make a game, because uh, that's really bad, don't do that ever. Um, it is still about trying to make something useful from government data um, that they've provided. Like, you, you are still a gov hack, you just happen to be making a game. That's the trick, you've got to work within the context. Uh, so how do you go about this? Um, well, basically you need to come up with a game idea. Luckily this is easy because everyone has ideas and anything can be a game. I was trying to think of something that can't be a game and I gave up. Um, so some examples from Global Game Jam, which to the best of my knowledge is the world's largest game jam. Uh, it's running next week, I think? This, this weekend. This weekend, okay, there you go. Uh, so some of their previous concepts that they, they've required as their theme that you have to run from. So Global Game Jam gives you a theme at the start. You have to make a game by the end that uses this theme. These are some of their themes. My favorite one is their The Sound of a Heartbeat, um, which came up with some really weird stuff, um, but a lot of fun. Uh, and every single one of these uh, different themes that were there resulted in some very awesome games, despite the fact the themes that were offered were things that don't naturally lean themselves to a game. Like, what does a robberus have to do with a game? Like, I don't know. But someone sat down and made a game from it. So we said, hey, this, why can't tax be interesting? Like, <laughs> who doesn't love tax, right? Um, or census info, you know, why, why can't you make something fun out of that? Or the energy star efficiency rating on your, your fridge. Why can't that be fun? Uh, that, that's the first one we ever actually did at GovHack. Uh, so we made marvelous ultimate appliances. Um, Does anyone get that pun? Somebody actually gets the pun? Okay, yeah. like two of you. So Nobody got that pun during GovHack. Yeah, we make bad pun Ooh, based so names. Proud. Yeah, we're like, oh my god, we could call this. And yeah, yeah, and then no one got it. Um, so basically, what we were discovering, so we're just combing through the different data sets that the uh, was provided to us on data.gov. Um, and we said, hey, look, appliances have all these stats on them. Um, they've got this nice big energy star rating, you know, they've got uh, kilowatt hours, all this different sort of stuff there. And luckily, the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, got that correct, collects all the stats for literally every single electrical device sold in the country because it has to go through certification and so on. So we said, oh, hell, what the hell, let's make Pokemon. Um, <laughs> And it's actual Pokemon, at least from a battling perspective, unlike Pokemon Go. Um, so yeah, we made Marvelous Ultimate Appliances, um, which is a game in which you battle fridges, uh, basically, is the idea. Um, so you know, we started with all these different bits, we scraped down all the data, we collected it all. It turns out there's a lot of data. Um, pretty much everything you need, you've got manufacturers, you've got kilowatts, you've got types. 
so on and so forth. Uh, we munged that up with some terrible Perl, Python, Go, uh, uh, that, anything that we had at the time that we felt like fiddling with. And we came up with this in the end, um, which is our lovely sort of game here. Um, looks a little bit like that when you actually start battling. And we should have a little video here. Press, press, press. Oh, sorry, one more. Uh, so what we're doing here is this is us filming the video. So it's a competitive game. We've got two players. Uh, the first player here is buying their different stuff. Um, they're going through. What are they going to buy there? Uh, I think they bought a. Is that a fridge or a washing machine? I can't quite it's tell. Oh, it's a television. It's, I'm at a weird angle and I don't get to see it. So they just bought a TV. Bad choice. Um, uh, <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what that one is. And then we've got our other player here. They're also buying some stuff. What was the one that you always win with? Like washing machines? Uh, no, fridges. Fridges? fridges. <laughs> uh, it turns out, like, dollar for energy efficiency, fridges laugh at everything else. Um, because something we didn't realize at the time, there they are, they're tapping. They're not tapping. That's a thing that's owned by Wizards of the Coast. Matt, <laughs> Wizards of the Coast. They're combating there, and it turns out that the television beat the... What was that? Not quite sure what that was. The television beat the oven, or whatever it was in this case. Uh, and, you know, obviously it was just a bit of fun. We did start learning things. Like, we've learned, and it's always stuck in my head, fridges actually have really good energy star ratings compared to most other things, because it's per category, which we didn't really realize at the time. Um, so, like, a really energy efficient fridge may actually be worse than a television, or better than a television on pure numbers, but from, like, the little star rating, it'll just, like, laugh at it. Um, so, like, fridges were great dollar for killing power um, in Pokemon-based uh, electrical battling games. Just <laughs> keep that in the back here for the next one. So, it turns out people actually learned a lot about how electrical appliances work by playing that game, so it worked out really um, well. And the Australian government actually contracted someone to make uh, an, a, an electrical appliance app where you could scan your, your fridge or whatever and it would tell you what it was. And they said that was directly because of seeing our thing. They made it properly. We did it in a golf hack. Um, so our next thought is, uh, so a game in which players yell about each other about whose fault it is. Um, so it's a life simulator. Uh, no, the, the idea was, um, has anyone here played Space Team before? Yeah, excellent. Okay, so um, we made What is Gov? Uh, baby, don't hurt me. Um, which was a government responsibility uh, game. Um, and it was primarily sourced from the Commonwealth Agency and Functions list. It turns out they actually have really well-defined responsibilities and roles as to who is meant to do what. We munged that down uh, into JSON because we like JSON. Uh, we took everything we could get. So, for example, the Australian Postal, Postal Corporation is responsible for postal services, telecommunications, territory administration, and electoral matters. Uh, we then added some costs and stuff for our game. That we, I think we ended up scrapping that in the end, but, you know, it was still part of it. Um, and then we created a whole bunch of different scenarios that could be resolved with these different responsibilities. So, like, you know, you've got people who are responsible for launching satellites. They need to understand meteorology, so on and so forth. Uh, and then what we made was a multiplayer competitive little game here. Uh, so it's just a little video here. So they're starting up a uh, network there. We got together, players connected, we're ready to go. So at the top, we'll have red tape, which is ticking <laughs> up from memory. <laughs> uh, yeah, you've got to stop the red tape from getting to the end, and you pick the right person for the current problem. So currently, we need to grant an export permit. Uh, you had to pick the correct person. We've got to generate electricity. You had to pick the correct person. This was multiplayer, so you'd actually have up to eight people, I think, we supported. Yeah. Um, it was local multiplayer, so it was just found, multiplayer found devices only. nearby and um, connected them to each other, yeah. And so I'll just show a quick little video of that. I believe this one has audio. Right. Right. Alan asking for peacekeepers. Oh, one way. I've got peacekeepers. We're the one way! We won. Um, <laughs> the... <laughs> I don't remember that being Still in there, but okay. <laughs> Going. Basically, uh, at the end of a certain number of missions, I guess you call them, you, it determined you got re-elected because you weren't incompetent, uh, was the, the scenario there. Um, so the first thing we discovered is actual politicians are scarily good at this game. Like, um, we had Michael Ferguson, he's a local politician, come in because he's the guy responsible for help running it in Tasmania. Uh, and he thrashed the crap out of us. At it. Um, he was just sitting there. He was just playing it by himself. He was just like, boop, 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 boop. Like, effortlessly. Like, we're like, what the hell? So I mean, obviously we did something right there because uh, yeah, we mapped some things correctly. 
Uh, it turns out politicians are way better at politics games than, than you or I, but it does show that the potential's there. Truthfully, we didn't expect that. Yeah, we were surprised. Um, so then we thought, uh, well, you know, we thought we'd go a little bit more philosophical. Uh, yeah, who here really knows how their politicians vote on things? We want to make it so everyone would know how their politician votes, so you know, we're aiming big. So we made uh, Question Time, which is the, uh, I guess, lovely art uh, from Rex Meal. Good job, Rex. Uh, which was a um, quiz-based game about do you actually know how your politicians vote? Uh, and we did that by more or less scraping the Hansard uh, and using They Vote For You, which is a service which also collects a lot of voting statistics. So for those who don't know, the Hansard is the log of everything that's said in the Australian Parliament. Nice. And it's all like semantically tagged and neatly divided and stuff. It's all available for you to use. Um, so basically, you would choose your MP. Uh, we only had a fixed list in there because we didn't really have time to draw pictures for all of them and get you know, the, the proper scraping down. You would then, this is back when Tone was still in charge, um, you would be given sort of actual, actual things that they voted for and you had to vote how they voted, uh, or you could abstain if they abstained, and then it would actually give you a uh, result. But the thing is, this was competitive, so it was two players playing it, and then the one who got the most correct mapping to their politician was the one who won. Uh, as an aside, the Hansard data, if you've never looked at it, is amazing. Um, like, it is XML. It's even like a weird HTML thing. But it's like fully mapped. Completely and utterly by humans who spend ages making sure that it's all semantically linked correctly. So you can just scrape it however you want and do whatever you want. This is actually done on the fly by people with an earpiece and voice recognition and like a correction keyboard. Look it up. It's completely it's really, relevant really to the talk, but it's really data. cool how they do this. Uh, and there's a service called Parl Pass, which was made by the UK government for their Hansard um, into something a little bit more manageable. Really worth checking out. It's really, really good. Uh, so then our latest game, which we made. Um, Last, last year, year, not this year anymore, we're in 2017 now, uh, was a competitive news headline party game. Um, and this one came purely about because we saw the fantastic data that the ABC had provided for GovHack. Uh, so we may beat the press. Um, you can see our art getting better over time. Yeah, I, I love this art. Sorry, I'm just going to take a minute. So nice. Um, so the, the thing is, this came about because news is actually really boring. We wanted people to have fun while engaging with the news. Uh, so what you do in this game is you fly around using your journalistic grabbing claw um, to grab the appropriate image to match the headline. So the headlines are scrolling down the bottom. Uh, you will grab the correct image and then drop it into there. We also had some like Markov chain generated gibberish headlines which are weirdly correct sounding, uh, <laughs> which would deduct your points. And then uh, essentially the person at the end who had the correct mapping would win. Um, this was 99% of the data from this came from ABC's News Gateway. The data was absolutely amazing. Uh, they actually had full history of going back decades of every article the ABC had ever posted, um, fully semantically tagged in everything in a consistent manner, again by some poor editor, I imagine. Had titles, it had images, it, uh, everything was linked. It had short and long descriptions of the images, so you didn't even have to worry about what they actually were. You could scrape it all. It was absolutely beautiful. Uh, they appear to have taken it down. Um, I guess they only had it up for GovHack, which is a little bit sad, but hopefully it'll come back. It was really, really amazing. So apparently they're working on making this a more reliable thing, and the, the thing they had up for GovHack was some sort of staging test proof, proof of concept. So it is going to come back, apparently. But it's really, really good. If you ever need to scrape news data for something interesting news-related, when this comes back up, grab it. Um, so I'm going to hand over to John now. So I'm going to talk about how we actually derive these uh, hopefully fairly interesting sounding game ideas from the fairly dry concepts underlied them. So the thing that we start from is the fact that every single game that you have ever played is built out of a number of intersecting systems. These mechanics drive interactions between both the player and also parts of the game and you get fun out of them. Um, now, games are built out of systems, and it also turns out that the world is built out of these kinds of systems as well. So this makes for a very nice mapping. All you have to do is find the similarities and play with them. So if you find, for example, that there's a certain resource transfer happening in the world, you can try and map that and create an analogue in your game. Or you can create some kind of shouting system that relies on the relationship between two different people who have different responsibilities. So how do you preserve the spirit and the meaning of your game? Well, when you go to go make an application or some kind of uh, enjoyable thing that is meant to be a not complete representation of a real world process, you need to remember to try and not be ultra realistic. 
the real world is less fun than a video game. So, I mean, hopefully that's fairly, you know, people know that already. Um, and uh, if not, then I want to live in your world. Um, but taking liberties with this kind of stuff is absolutely fine. So the amount of data that we actually, not fabricated, but certainly massaged into a form that could be more, made more fun was not insubstantial when it came to, uh, I think, every single one of those four games that we just uh, demonstrated. So modifying the real world for your game is fine, but you have to remember to not take it so far as to make the player lose sight of that underlying theme. This is a really tricky balance to achieve, but it is better to fail on the side of being more fun and not too realistic. Now, when you're designing these kinds of things in the context of a hackathon, a purportedly serious hackathon, you need to engage three groups of people. So you need to engage, first of all, the player, the person actually using your software, the software that you're making should engage your player for hopefully obvious reasons. But just as importantly, you also need to engage your fellow participants, people who are doing the jam with you, do at the hackathon with you, working on their own projects. Because the way that these kinds of things work is people are walking around taking breaks and they want to see something cool on your screen. So doing the jam sounds like something from an 80s like teen commercial. Well, I mean, we did that too. But <laughs> so in addition to the player and also your fellow participants who are going to be the ones doing word of mouth, both during the, the, uh, during the hackathon, I'm not going to say the word jam anymore because now I feel very self-conscious, um, during the hackathon and also afterwards as well in the, in the uh, social media cooldown, you also have to uh, engage with the jam's stakeholders. So the people who are the ones who supply the, both the resources, the venue and everything like that, the sponsors, but also those who want something out of the hackathon. We mentioned earlier that large organizations, very large corporations as well, are doing their own hackathons. And the reason they're do, doing this is not just because they think it's cool to have the word hack in, an, in, in something. They want quantifiable, measurable outcomes. For example, the Qantas Hackathon was uh, primarily a source of inexpensive Q&A. Uh, sorry, um, R&D, not Q&A. Um, R&D. So out of that, they got a number of very, very cool projects. Um, one of them was uh, a kids game, which we worked on. Um, so there's a number of different people that you have to engage. So how do you do this? What's the most efficient way to get these many people all you know, fired up? And it turns out that Multiplayer games are the best way of doing this. Now, this is true for several reasons. The first is, it is much easier to be fun when you see two people playing together. Additionally, if you're making some kind of game, usually that game is going to involve some kind of interaction or conflict between players. So whether those players are a human or a computer-driven player. And if it's multiplayer, then you don't need to write an AI. You know, the human brain is a pretty good AI. Uh, yeah. Um, and also AI is quite hard to write. Even more importantly, most importantly maybe, it's really fun to show this kind of stuff in person. Because you can simply hand someone a controller and say, here, join my game. People love seeing people having fun. And people want to see a game between players. Multiplayer is almost as fun to not participate in. You can stand off to the sidelines and watch people play a game. That's fun, even if they're not holding the controller. And as you saw before, it's fun to show in demo videos. You enjoyed seeing people laughing even though you couldn't see their screens. Now, that said, multiplayer game design is not easy. Designing for a single human is challenging enough. Designing for multiple humans is, uh, well, it gets really nasty. Now, by multiplayer, what I'm talking about is primarily local multiplayer. Local multiplayer means that you have a single computer and multiple sources of input to that single computer, as opposed to network multiplayer, where you have two or more machines talking to each other over the network. This is a case of do as we say, not do as we do, because most of our games are actually network multiplayer. <laughs> yeah, and every single time we've gone to do a network multiplayer game, we go, oh, I really wish this was done locally. Uh, because uh, uh, if you ever, who's ever had to do some kind of multiplayer game over the network? Yeah, yeah. Who enjoyed it? <laughs> uh, the, the neatest suggest solution to our networking at Hackathon, making something quickly that's networkable at a Hackathon that we've come up with, is to have a Google SRE on our team. Yes. <laughs> so yes, uh, if Josh is here, then um, yeah, then you're set. <laughs> 
So if you can get away with it, and if it suits the design of your game, then do it that way. The only reason why uh, um, the games that we've used for local multiplayer, sorry, for network multiplayer, had to have local, I keep saying local, um, I'll start again. The only reason why games that had networked multiplayer needed it was because they were on separate phones. Very hard to have local multiplayer on a small screen. So if you do have to have networked multiplayer, Never do it over the net, just do it over the LAN. Because the internet adds all kinds of things, especially on the bad Wi-Fi that you're on. Additionally, turn-based games are always easier to implement than a real-time game. So a turn-based game is one in which people take turns making a thing, or people take turns at the same time. So simultaneous turn-taking is what we did in What is Gov, where people are all working at the same time and they submit. But of course, if you must do it in real time, then keep it ultra, ultra simple. So the, the more complex you make your underlying foundation, the simpler you must make your game. And that can lead to you know, potentially a less satisfying uh, game. The most important thing is never get clever. You have 48 hours at most t taking away sleep, which we'll talk about in a second. Now, by not being clever, what I really mean is don't be a good engineer. You get to do all kinds of stuff during a hackathon. You get to make assumptions about the environment in which your software runs. You get to ignore things like latency. You can assume you have unlimited bandwidth. You can poll the server if you want to. You can even do things like ignoring the problem of cheating. It's fine. You know? If they cheat, then they're right next to you. You can poke them and say, don't do that. You get to ignore all sorts of things. Uh, it pays to remember what you ignore and sometimes document that, though, because we've been asked to demo hackathon games months later and then spent up to a day or two trying to figure out why the server won't work to realize we've hard-coded an IP address and it just didn't work anymore. Yeah. Yes. So w when you make assumptions about the environment, you have to remember what those assumptions were. Um, on top of this, you can also do stuff like you can trust the client. So uh, in multiplayer games, typically, it's a bad idea for a client, a player, to say, hey, server, I actually got a headshot. And the server going, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> like, that's fine in these situations. You can also not have to worry too much about long-term balance and replayability. What is Gov is actually not very fun beyond the first five minutes. That's fine, because demos only last five minutes. In fact, players will spend never more than 50 minutes in total playing the game. So you get to make all kinds of assumptions about that. And it's important to remember that you'll never return to this code, ever. <laughs> so you don't ever have to worry about you know, making a good reusable system. It's not going to get reused. And the goal here is to make something work at all. You can completely forget about making it work right, okay? whatever right means. So let's talk about how we can achieve these goals while still staying on message. And by on message, I mean the message being promoted by the organizer of the hackathon. We mentioned before that it's a bad idea to charge in saying, ha ha, forget your context, I'm gonna do my own thing. Because that's a really great way to make friends. Because it's so important to remain relevant, um, especially if you intend to try and get a prize if prizes are being offered. Because Simply by doing a non-traditional thing, a non-product thing like a game, is weird enough. So doing any kind of game is often you know, outside the norm sufficiently. You don't need to prove anything else. Now, you should also try to not get too weird with your idea. Um, typically, ideas become weirder over time in the first place, so don't charge in there with a tremendously artistic vision. Um, because you are going to end up just making the whole thing way too complicated. This will also help to keep your design very simple, which, uh, as I hopefully have uh, made clear so before, is so important. The first game we actually made based on government data was the Pokemon Battle Game with the appliances, and if it wasn't obvious, that was probably the most complex one of the ones we mentioned, and then we got simpler from there every time, because yeah. it was a lot easier to make a simpler game out of the data that was still fun and expressed what we wanted to express. In fact, the, uh, the most recent game we did, which was the, the, the fighting news game, is no more complicated than when you press the arrow buttons, you move around, and we are pulling down some text from a server and showing it on the screen. Like, that's fundamentally all it is. And there's very, very simple game design. It's so important to cut absolutely mercilessly. You have to be able to recognize when a feature is critical and when a feature is not. Every single feature, for the most part, like law of large numbers, is 
not critical. You can cut it. You can lose the whole thing if you need to. You should be cutting early. You should be cutting very, very often. Otherwise, you'll not get a thing done. And getting a thing done is the most important part of this. Importantly, though, as you cut, you should cut in the direction of the theme. We had a whole bunch of ideas for our most recent game about, oh, we'll have amazing particle effects, we'll have, uh, like, when, you, when you shoot different objects out, they'll hit the ground and they'll shatter into a million pieces. But that's not really what open data is about, and so we lost it. Instead, we focused on the features that were pulling in different sources of information and focused on, like, the, uh, I'm not going to say the word boring, but, oh, whoops, I did. Um, you know, the, 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 they weren't the boring stuff, but they were the stuff that, that were concrete foundational stuff that applied to the hackathon. There is one exception, and that is audio. Audio is often overlooked and is the most vital thing to have in a game because audio completes a game. Whether it's a single track of music, whether it's some kind of, you know, impact sound effect, something, it really gels the whole experience for your players and turns it into a really engaging thing. Even if the game's not fun, if it sounds good, it'll feel fun. One thing you've always wanted to try is generating audio from some of the open data. Even if it's completely an irrelevant connection, it seems like that would be a fun idea to try. Mm. One day. After your hackathon is completed, it's important that you have something that looks good in demos. People are going to look at the demo video much, much more frequently than they'll look at the game itself. That's why we design stuff that gets people to yell at each other. Because it's really great to have photos of people smiling and shouting at the screen. It's also, and for the same reason, it's something that you want to make people come by and uh, look at as well. So it's something that's eye-catching, doesn't have to be fun when you play it, it should be fun when you look at it. Now that's not to say that you should be content-free, but more realise the type of audience that's going to be looking at your thing. So it's really important to make something that's fun to watch people play. So it's, it's, it's really boisterous. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's the reason why we, we did this, uh, stuff like this. It gets people excited, both people at the jam, but also people that the jam is for, the data providers, the sponsors, and people who want to get, in this case, open data into a wider public sphere. The most important thing is to not be annoying about your boisterousness. So don't just make it make noise randomly. Don't be obnoxious. Uh, we made Beat the Press with exactly this goal in mind, because while it's a very loud, active game, we tried to not make it too loud and too annoying. So, a couple of high-level points for uh, how, how to do jams. The most critical thing for any kind of time-constrained thing is time is your enemy. And that's, you know, people go, oh yes, well, that makes sense, I only have 48 hours. But it's not your enemy in the, in the way that you think. When you have a time limit, this tends to foster a deadline-oriented mindset. And by deadline-oriented mindset, what I mean is this kind of thinking where you go, well, we only have this much time, better work super hard and fast, because that kind of thing will end in disaster for you. All-nighters are super deceptive. It makes a lot of sense, especially if you're younger, to go, oh, that's fine, I'll just keep working and I'll sleep afterwards. Because you never do your best work on an all-nighter. And hopefully that's the thing that has sunk into the community by now. Um, but when a game jam happens or a hackathon happens, for some reason a lot of people just throw that advice out the window and go, well, yeah, but not this time. This time I'll be productive all night. Um, so your, pr your productivity will decline over time. I made this graphic after an all-nighter just to prove my point. Uh, <laughs> so really, if you come away with one piece of advice from our entire presentation, it's go home at night. Go home and, and sleep. You know, get at least seven hours sleep, even though that's seven of your 24 hours. That's still fine. Because you will arrive back rested at a decent time, and the quality of your result is better than the quantity of the work. Like, it's a time-constrained game jam. It's a hackathon. No one expects you to produce a huge amount in the first place. Now, this is another reason for why you should cut features mercilessly. You don't have time quality over quantity. So let's talk about how we can preserve the meaning of uh, what we're trying to achieve here within a game. Now, you don't actually often need to be ultra faithful to this. Marvelous Ultimate Appliances is a game about making appliances fight each other in the 1950s. It's not 
actually about why it's important to have energy efficient appliances. That's just a data point that's used in the game mechanics. Rather, raising engagement with what the game happens to touch on, rather than going into it in depth, is really often enough. You don't need to spend a huge amount of time say, carefully explaining, oh, well, see, it's, it's important to have you know, high efficiency appliances because of the environment, when you could just well go, energy stars are a thing that make your fridge fight better. So, so uh, you might ask, as when uh, the notes here say, as when you would do when watching a game of cricket, you might ask why do any of this in the first place. So I'm not sure why that's there. I'm pretty sure John wrote that. Uh, we get asked a lot, uh, how do you make games pretty often? And our one main answer for that is the best way to do that is to just try and make one and make it. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> the problem is games are hard to make. People get a bit intimidated at the idea of making a game. They think it's somehow special or magic compared to other software. Highly accomplished software engineers run, run in terror when they think of making a game. It's very strange. Uh, games are often seen as these huge monolithic projects because people look at the games with $400 million budgets and think, I can't make a game. That's what a game is. Uh, so we like to use external pressures like hackathons, particularly open data ones because they're kind of out of left field to make a game, and game jams to constrain ourselves to actually make games. It's a lot of fun for you. It's fun for players. It's fun for the event organizers. Uh, when five teams make a really cool map-based mashup and then there's one game, you don't actually upstage the other people, you just break the monotony and actually make people look at their thing more often because it's not the same thing over and over again. Uh, so that's really our message here. You can tweet us at these places. And we're going to show you a quick video of one of the games, I think, now. Yes. Okay, so you can watch this and then we'll take questions if we have time. Question time. A game of policy. Does anyone really remember how their representatives vote in Parliament? Probably not. I don't really know how anyone votes. Despite the existence of powerful web-based tools like They Vote For You and ABC's Vote Compass, people often don't know how their representatives are directing their votes. We built a multiplayer game to make understanding and engaging with the decisions made by Parliament more exciting and memorable. Our game is called Question Time and it combines data from Hansard, Australia's edited transcripts of parliamentary debates and divisions, data from ABC's Vote Compass and data generated by the Open Australian Parser. We heavily prototyped a number of game concepts centred around the idea of presenting an MP and quizzing the player on how they voted on various issues. With our concept ready to go, we started the hacking. Yeah. Our back-end server is built in Go, Google's new powerful and modern systems programming language, and our front-end in Swift, Apple's new programming language. The heart of a great project is the visuals, so we made sure to create a number of truly inspiring caricatures of a selection of representatives to show off the concept, as well as a stunning custom user interface. Question Time is played by two players, with each selecting an MP and a portfolio area. Both players then answer questions about both portfolio areas from the perspective of their chosen MP. Questions are answered by choosing where their MP might stand on a spectrum of strongly disagree to strongly agree, or choosing to abstain. At the end of the game, the player who came closest to choosing their MP's real opinions, in line with their votes in Parliament, is declared the winner. Data drawn from the results of ABC's Vote Compass, showing the opinion of Australians on issues related to the questions asked, is then presented to the players as an end game summary. The member has Question time helps people better understand how their MPs are voting on a variety of issues. By wrapping this vital understanding of democracy in action in an exciting game, citizens are more likely to engage with it, becoming better informed, engaged and excited by politics. I've played your game. And now I understand it all! Yeah. We'll leave under 94A. We've opened all our code, art, music, sound and data on GitHub. Our team of coders, data wizards, audio and visual artists and others is based in Hobart, Tasmania, where we can often be found coding, researching, making good art and engineering. Thanks for watching. Check out the website for more information. Not authorised by the Australian Government, Canberra. Spoken by Arabella. Yeah. So, so that's our presentation. If anyone has any questions, I guess we've probably got time, five-ish minutes. Yeah, cool. Otherwise, we can just leave. Might just quickly add, that's the video we submitted to the GovHack people. That's why it's very weird in some of the wording there. And also, um, 
the reason why it goes into detail about that, uh, ooh, Swift is a new language, like that people don't actually know about any programming stuff at all in, uh, in that audience. It's really easy to trick people who don't know programming stuff. Also, programming Swift was actually stuff. new then. Oh, it yeah, was too, wasn't it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah I forgot about that. Uh, are there any questions, I guess? Hi, I'm thinking of doing something on our farm with a robot running around a paddock and thought it might be interesting to get someone to engage to identify weeds. Um, how would that be fun? <laughs> <laughs> so I can think of a few, a few different ways. Um, one is you would want to have some kind of uh, point screen mechanism where uh, players compete to try and find a certain number of weeds in a given time frame. Um, we, when you add some kind of uh, you know competitive nature with a time constraint, then um, that's like some bread and butter fun stuff. Um, Another way you could do that would be some kind of antagonistic element as well. You have one player who is trying to trick of, uh, players into uh, finding the wrong kind of stuff. So, so there's a website called 8kindsoffun.com, which is the digit 8 and then kindsoffun.com, which is a, a game design, a very famous game designer's website where he talks about the different kinds of fun people find in games. And it's got a list of the ways in people get fun out of games. And it's a probably a good starting point to start thinking about stuff like that. Uh, out of the games you've showed there, uh, none really have a mapping element. H have any of you played around with or experimented with uh, geolocation or mapping in, in games? Um, yes. Um, the reason why we have avoided maps, uh, one of the things we're actually sitting down working on is we were, we were playing around uh, last year with the public toilet database um, yeah, and this year, last year was like right next to the Pokemon Go craze. Yeah. So like like Bogemon and put like Pokemon <laughs> in the bathroom and stuff. Um, the, the, the main reason why we've always stayed away from the maps is because that's what 99% of everyone else at GovHack does. Because mapping things is really useful and really easy. So a side effect is you'll have 100 mapping projects and then two non-mapping projects and then us making a game. Uh, so we tend to avoid maps just for that reason. Now that's not to say that uh, maps, you know, are non-interesting, especially when they're not games. It's more that like, they're, they're, there's just so many maps on screen that uh, we we didn't want to add to that. Any other questions? One. So at the time, um, uh, Swift was kind of new, and I understand it didn't really have very good exception handling, or uh, like in 2015, no. Yeah, so uh, how was your experience using Swift at the time? Fantastic, loved it. Um, yeah, I mean, we had been doing stuff for Apple platforms for some time, and so Swift was designed with those uh, programming practices in mind. Um, so that meant that, you know, without the presence of um, the now native uh, error handling system, you just did it the old Objective-C way, and that worked just totally fine. Um. So it's a really good opportunity at hackathons to use new technology that you don't necessarily trust for real stuff yet and make yourself learn it and build something that's finished. So that's why we use Swift, that's why we've used Go when it was brand new, that's why we've used all sorts of things when they're brand new, just to see if we can make something with it and then further our skills in those languages. Um, additionally, it's a 48 hour thing, so if it crashes, you just restart it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the audiences are much more tolerant and also you can edit that out in the video. <laughs> Oh, one at the back. Given that you talk about using new technologies all the time, the answer to this might be obvious, but how much do you rely on code from previous attempts to pull in, you know, how, how difficult is it to go from a first al al attempt? Almost never. Um, the goal is to... So, so there's two reasons. One is that um, in the case of GovHack, uh, you are required to open source everything, and that meant that we weren't going to use, you know, uh, proprietary libraries or stuff that we had uh, that only we had license to. When you do games, it's also very common to, you know, purchase um, a toolkit from some asset store and use that. But we couldn't do that in this case because we weren't allowed to open source it. So we did it all ourselves. Um, and secondly, you know, it's fun to make a new system, so we did. <laughs> Thank you.
In the keynote this morning, they were talking a lot about failure, which I liked. Has there ever been, and you said you can make taxes and census data fun, has there ever been a concept you pursued that you were excited about that actually in the end just didn't work at all? Um, I feel like there was, but I can't remember. I, I, I mean, there's a lot of aborted concepts that never got beyond the pen and paper sort of thing, like the, the Bogomon, um, where we're like, that this is the best thing I'd no, ever, no, and no, then, no, oh. Okay, okay. There was one we deemed in, uh, too offensive to build, uh, which was the, there's a database of where Australians have died on road deaths and other things, and we were going to make like a Ghostbusters game where you have to wrestle ghosts <laughs> back into the, the chamber, but we decided we shouldn't do that. Uh, part of the reason why we decided that was because many of those deaths were actually quite recent, and so we realised that we would probably be talking about people who had died very recently. Uh, the database also had headshots of all the people. Oh. So no, yeah. Um. <laughs> Like, I, I would say most of the, at the concepting stage, you, you more or less just throw something out and then 10 minutes later you realise that, no, it's a terrible idea and it won't work. Um, so I'd say there's heaps. Um, we've never made anything to completion that isn't fun just because of prototyping. Yeah, and really, even if you uh, realise that your game idea is, or, or like the theme that you've chosen, is actually less fun than you thought, that's okay. You can just make it less realistic and focus on the game rather than the stuff that was in, in, in inspiring the game. Like, we realise that the, <laughs> there's nothing actually very fun about reading news headlines, but there is a lot of fun in flying around a, a gigantic floating news desk with a grabbing claw. So... Especially if your character is Lil and Jin. Yes. Oh, yeah. We actually made. Uh, yeah. Li, li, li Lin Chin insults you as you play. It's kind of great. Uh, I think it's lunchtime. Oh, we, yeah. Yes. Uh, that, that's our official lunchtime. So, if everybody could thank. Um, <laughs>